It's time now for a look at the latest in local news. In the news, a college school board meeting held this morning at the Tech Center and a big crowd on hand. The majority of people asking that the mask mandate be lifted and allow students and teachers to have a choice on masks. Those that want to wear them, no problem. The people who do not should not be mandated to do so. One lady had a sign that said, support parents' rights and reject medical tyranny. At the meeting, 12 people signed up to speak under public participation, and only two of the 12 asked that a mask mandate be issued. We'll have some of the public comments on next week's newscast. Bottom line is that there will be no mask mandates this coming school year at Wayne County School System. There will be some COVID-19 protocols in place, and those are expected to be released by the superintendent later today, and we'll have those on Monday's newscast. Chairman Nick Ellis laid it out today, saying that the bottom line is the Board of Education had a no-mask mandate policy in place back on May 25th, and unless the board voted to change that policy, that policy remains. It was stated that the superintendent's policy released last week was without board approval or a vote, and unless under a government emergency order, the superintendent doesn't have that authority to make policy without board approval. So unless the board voted today to rescind the policy voted back on May 25th, the original policy remains in place. Board member Sharon Daniel, who's in favor of kids and teachers wearing masks at school, motioned to rescind the May 25th vote. Board member Ray Davison seconded the motion. The motion was voted down by a 3-2 vote, with Davison and Daniel voting yes, and Bruce Harris, Nick Ellis, and Joe McPipkin voting no. After the meeting, board member Ray Davison told WIFOFM that he was simply confused on what the motion was and said that he's definitely in favor of people having the choice to decide whether or not to wear a mask. Chairman Ellis says that the superintendent was going on information he received, and Ellis says that use the word overstepped is incorrect. But he did say that without a board vote, the original policy remains in place. So again, with school doors opening on Monday, masks will not be required. But if a teacher or student feels that they want to wear a mask, they're allowed to do so. Once again, it's freedom of choice. Board members thank those who came, thank them for keeping it an orderly meeting, encourage more people to come to meetings and become involved in their child's education. Again, we'll have more from the meeting on Monday's newscast. In other news... A new date has been set for the case of State of Georgia versus Earl Watson, who's charged with murder and the shooting death of Gary Floyd, which occurred back in July of 2018 on Little Creek Road. Judge Stephen Kelly in court Thursday with prosecutor in the case Diane McLeod and defense attorney Tracy Brown. New date is set for October the 19th with jury selection set for that day. Attorneys told the judge that they expect jury selection to last two days and the trial to last about a week. All pretrial motions have been dealt with. Defense attorney Tracy Brown asked the judge again about the ankle monitor that his client has been ordered to wear. Brown had previously filed a motion that the monitor be taken off as the defense claims that the cost is a burden on the defendant as COVID has delayed the trial more than once and the monthly cost of the ankle monitor continues to pile up as they await to trial. Kelly's yet to rule on that motion and Brown asked again on Thursday if the judge would consider ruling on the motion. Once again, no decision made Thursday by Judge Kelly, so the ankle monitor remains at this time. Earl Watson's out on bail this time. Once again, jury selection now set for October 19th. With Mayor David Earl Keith's announcement at Tuesday's council meeting that he is st- stepping down as of September 1st, Jessup Council will meet Monday at 5 p.m. for the purpose of passing a resolution for the special election to fill the mayor's unexpired term. That's set for Monday at 5 p.m. Should coincide with the upcoming city election set for November. Already one candidate in the race as County Commissioner Ralph Hickox on Thursday announced that he'll be seeking the position of city mayor of Jessup. Sent out a release Thursday afternoon, and we'll have more on that on Monday's newscast. But again, Ralph Hickox currently represents District 5 on the County Council set to run for the position of mayor of Jessup. We'll be back with more news after this word from our sponsor of the commercial messages, so please stay tuned. Sheriff Chuck Mosley of the Wayne County Sheriff's Department and Chief Perry Morgan of the Jessup PD announced that on August 4th, the Jessup Wayne Tactical Narcotics Team conducted a Fourth Amendment waiver search at 94 Cassie Lane in Wayne County. Search resulted from a narcotics arrest that occurred at a road check being conducted by the Georgia State Patrol, assisted by the Wayne County Sheriff's Office K-9 units, during the search of 94 Cassie Lane, investigators discovered approximately 60 grams of methamphetamine. 40-year-old Brandy Zell of Jessup and 44-year-old Roderick Jenkins of Jessup were arrested and faced multiple charges, including possession of a Schedule II controlled substance with the intent to distribute and trafficking in methamphetamine. This investigation is ongoing and may result in further arrest and charges. The sheriff and police chief also announced that during the month of July, the Wayne County Narcotics Team conducted an undercover operation of businesses located in Jessup, Wayne County, selling tobacco vape products to underage juveniles. This investigation is in response to multiple complaints to both the Wayne County Sheriff's Department and the Jessup Police Department about multiple businesses selling these products to children <coughs> excuse me, in our community. As a result of this investigation, the cashiers of the following businesses 
had been charged for selling tobacco-related products to underage juveniles. Red Hill General Marathon 301 North, Shell 301 North, Marathon 301 South, Country Corner, Shell Highway 84, Sitco First Street, and Market on First Street, Sitco Spring Grove Road at Rainier Road, and LIT Vapes by AT&T. During the operation, controlled undercover buys were attempted at 26 stores with, with successful buys at the above 10 stores, marking our compliance at 62%. They state they continue similar operations until 100% of the businesses in Wayne County are in compliance with state law. We've got more from the City Council meeting on Tuesday, which again lasted over two hours, as two topics discussed involve the McMillan Creek Greenway Boardwalk, which is currently closed due to damage after the hurricane passed through. The question is what to do and how much it will cost to repair the damage. Board member Nick Harris simply brought it up to start the discussion at Tuesday's council meeting, and here was the discussion Tuesday night. Next discussion, uh, McMillan Creek uh, Boardwalk, Chris Harris. Mr. Todd, do you have anything to say? Uh, other than that it's a pitiful condition, uh, unusable, uh, and when it is used, it's used in ways that ought not be used. Uh, I just think, yeah. Well, I just wanted to talk about it. We're going to have it, we're going to keep it. We need to do something about it because it's in bad shape. We've got trees fall across it. Uh, it's closed right now. Um, which goes to a bigger point that when we get grants and such for buildings or boardwalks or whatever, you need to think in advance what it's going to cost to upkeep it. And, you know, we, we, we know we're getting this money we, you know, from the federal government or state government or from, you know, whatever, but we, we never think about what it's going to take. You know, I keep preaching on Cracker Williams we got to start thinking about how much it's going to cost for the year to keep it up because we don't want to get back in disarray. So and again, that discussion Tuesday night, again, Commissioner Harris said he was just bringing it up to start the discussion. City Attorney Michael Connor advised the commissioners that with the federal grant, you just can't walk away from the project. It has to be upkept. Another topic discussed was the Cracker Williams swimming pool, which has been put on hold as apparently the council has been given false information on exactly what it will cost to build a swimming pool at Cracker Williams. Bill Harvey, who's been hands-on with the project, stated at the Tuesday night council meeting that people need to be aware that the bottom dollar figure is going to be staggering. The comment was made Tuesday by Commissioner Harris that we've been told untruths. Council states that the next move is to have engineer Bill Schumann consult and get with someone and come back with a dollar amount that it will take to build the pool and bring that amount back to the council. Harris stated that the council needs to learn that there is upkeep costs once something is built and that the city needs to start putting aside funding for the upkeep of projects built in the city. Finally, another topic at Tuesday's meeting agenda was meeting protocols and workforce diversity. On the agenda, Tyrone Johnson, who asked that the city add public participation to their agenda, similar to what the school board does, also asked that the council be more diverse in their hiring practices, giving each council member the breakdown of white and black employees in each department. Here was Tyrone Johnson speaking at Tuesday's council meeting. So she has been balancing the budget. She's been writing the checks. She's been making sure that Jessup has been within the, the bounds. And what was surprising at that meeting was the fact that the council had not had a discussion as to where the money was coming from before you got to the meeting. The citizens were alarmed. Like, what are they talking about? They got to figure out what account to pull it from. So that says, you know, we charge you guys to handle our business as citizens, and when you do well, we applaud you. When you don't, we criticize you. It's not an easy place to be as a public servant, but I want to encourage the city to develop, the last recommendation is to develop an action plan specifically to deal with the issue of race, particularly black women. Black women and white women combined are the majority taxpayers in this city. And if anything, we should see movement in both directions with women being hired in all aspects of the city. We have a fire department, we've got 14 employees over there, 13 white men, one white woman, no blacks. We have a police force, 30 employees, five African Americans, 25 Caucasians, only three women, one female police officer, and only two, uh, and two uh, two secretaries. So I just want to say 
that we cannot continue down this road of exclusion. We need to move the city in the direction of inclusion. Because at the end of the day, when you look at the, the census data, our city is changing. It's changing right before our very eyes. So this is not meant to be overly critical of anybody. So I really want to make that clear. I want to make clear that this is simply a charge. This is a charge to all public servants in the city to develop an action plan and take some time to look at what is actually before us and let's figure out a way that we can make Jessup better together. So Again, those comes to Tyrone Johnson. President of Tuesday's council meeting was Jessup Police Chief Perry Morgan, Fire Chief Josh Huffman, and Water Department Supervisor Anthony Crawford. Mayor Keith asked all three department heads at the meeting how many openings they currently had in the city of Jessup at their department. All stated that they had many each had several in their department that are currently advertising for those positions. The mayor stated there are opportunities out there available. People need to apply. One department head said they've advertised for a position for several months, but no one's even applied for the job. We'll be back for some final news notes after this word from our sponsor of the commercial messages. So please stay tuned. Final notes news, several events that we need to tell you about. Again, a big event this coming Saturday at Turning Point Worship Center. They've got a book bag giveaway with school supplies, also free haircuts and free manicure. That's taking place from 10 to 12 noon tomorrow at Turning Point Worship Center here in Jessup. Chamber of Commerce still selling tickets to their legacy dinner. Set for Thursday, August 19th at the Pine Forest Country Club at 7 p.m. Tickets are $75 for members, $100 for guests. Reserve a seat, call the chamber at 427-2028. And don't forget the Grand Slam Fishing Tournament is over August 21st and 22nd. Still people signing up for that event. Again, the entry fee is $50 per fisherman with a minimum of at least two paid entries to a boat. Registration forms can be picked up at the Tourism Board's office at the depot or registration is available online at active.com. Also, you can go to their website, waynetourism.com, or call the Tourism Board office at 912-427-3233. Again, the tournament hits underway August 21st and 22nd. Tur tournament begins Saturday 21st at 12 noon, continues until Sunday at 12 noon. Again, you must be in weigh-in at headquarters at J.C. Fairgrounds at J.C. Landing by 12 noon on Sunday. Again, also fishermen are allowed to two bush hooks per boat with the hooks clearly tagged and removed prior to weigh-in. No jugging is allowed in the event. Once again, the number for the Tourism Board, 427-3233. That's going to do it for the latest in local news. Sports comes your way in a few minutes. Bob Morgan, have a great day.